So this is the first topic of Unit 3 of National 5 Biology. And to begin with, we're going to look at some different ecological terms. Um, a lot of them you'll be familiar with and just know from general knowledge and from being in, in school before. Um, so some of them, certainly the first lesson, will just be a case of re-familiarising yourself. And there might be some new things in here as well. So I'm just going to go through these and hopefully some of them you'll already know. I think certainly as we go further down, you should be comfortable with it. So community, do you remember this? So community in terms of ecology, in, in terms of um, looking at the environment and habitats and so on, community is all the different species living within an ecosystem. And we'll come on to what an ecosystem is in a minute. But an example of a community would be rabbits, foxes, etc. You're just listing the different plants of animals in an area. Population. This is one that people get mixed up with the kind of geography definition of population, <clears throat> which would be, you know, the population of Scotland is 5.5 million. But in terms of ecology and biology, we're talking for about population as being all the organisms of one species living in an ecosystem. So in the community with the rabbits and foxes and so on, um, you would talk about there being a population of deer, a population of rabbits, a population of foxes. And then ecosystem. So that is the community which is living in a particular habitat. So it's all the plants and animals plus the non-living components with which the organisms interact. So that's a bit of a mouthful. It basically mean basically what it means non-living is things like light intensity, rainfall, the soil, um, that's the ecosystem, the mixture of the, the plants and animals and the habitat. So a soil ecosystem would be an example. And then habitat is simply the place where an organism lives, like woodland. Species, the definition for that is in sort of two, two parts to it. So first of all, it's a group of organisms which share the same physical characteristics, so they look similar. And the second bit is that they can reproduce produce fertile offspring. So fertile means that the offspring can make babies, the opposite of that being sterile. And then biodiversity is the variety of life in an area. So a wild meadow would have high biodiversity. Your lawn, if it's just got grass in it, that's one species, so that would be low biodiversity. Uh, these next words, I'm sure certainly some of these you'll know. Um, a producer is an organism which can make its own food. Can you do that? Can I do that? Well, we, you know, we're not talking about going to make a roll and sausage here. We're talking about, you know, from uh, basically from just standing outside. We can't do that, but as plants can. So that basically organisms which can carry out photosynthesis. Um, so, for example, grass. So we, on the other hand, we are consumers. So in order for us to gain energy, we need to eat another organism. So an example would be fox. So a consumer is basically everything except plants and other organisms which can carry out photosynthesis. A herbivore, some of these might some of you might be herbivores, um, basically vegetarian, gain energy by eating plants. Carnivore eats other animals. Omnivore, which most of us probably are, gain energy by eating both plants and animals. And then predator is an animal that lives by killing and eating other animals, like a lion. And the prey is the the animal that is hunted and killed by another for food. For example, rabbit. So just to some, again, the, the ones uh, down the bottom are a bit more you'll be comfortable with, but just to give you some images to maybe help you get the other ones into your head. So this is what we can see in this uh, idyllic picture is the community. So community, all of the different species living in the same ecosystem. So here you've got turtle, I'm presuming that's a salmon, deer, bear, raccoon is that, wolf, but don't forget the plants, plants as well, excuse me, don't forget the plants as well. So it's all the different species within the same ecosystem. Then biodiversity, that is the variety of life in an area. So you would imagine this has got high, relatively high biodiversity. You've got lots of different um, flowering plants in there. Then a population, this is the one where we always see mistakes. So that's the, all the organisms of one species living in an ecosystem. So they're 
here we have a population of giant panda or two members of that population. And I want to talk about trees. Isn't that beautiful? Look at this. So this is a very, very, very old tree. Um, unfortunately, we don't see too many like these. But if you were to if you were to be in um, Britain after the last ice age, you would see a land which is covered in trees and covered in ancient trees like this. And I suppose we think of a tree as just one living thing, but the amount of life which it can support is pretty staggering. And I'll let I'll um, just explain. Um, talk about a study that's been done which found out just how important trees are. So in 2009, a researcher sprayed insecticide, so that's a chemical that kills insects, on a 600-year-old 170-foot tall tree. And then sampling of the dead organisms was carried out. So I guess they maybe had like a mat, you know, tarpaulin underneath the tree and they looked at the dead organisms. Now, I suppose you may think, well, what's, that's not very good for the environment, but I guess it was the, the hope is that the the insects would, only some of them would die and the rest would recover. And it was to try and show the next point, which is there were 257 different species of insects and spiders which were counted. So I suppose that is to provide evidence in trying to pressurise governments and, and people to um, realise just how important trees are in terms of biodiversity. Moving on from that, what do you think this is? So we've got a large footprint and we have got a smaller footprint. And these footprints belong to which species do you think? Well, humans, but potentially not humans like us. So this is our ancestors, quite small. Um, and these footprints were uncovered and they're from 3.6 million years ago. So these are primates. Um, maybe not humans in, in the way that we would, the kind of species that we're in, but probably developed into our species. And um, they're our ancestors and they're 3.6 million years old. Now, the interesting thing about this is that what people have have um, postulated, I think is the word, or what they think might have happened here is you have got an adult and then you've got a child going beside it. Now, if a child is going beside an adult, then I suppose there's a good chance a small child are going to be holding hands. So this shows you maybe the kind of relationships even 3.6 million years ago that these animals had are not too dissimilar to ours. So second point would be if you had a small child with you, why would you be holding their hand? So I suppose for our today, it might be to um, stop them running on uh, stop them running on the roads, protect them from danger, and this would be the, it probably was the same situation here. So you had an adult and child walking side by side, and the reason is that at this time, um, humans would have been prey. We would have been prey animals. Um, so it would have been, yeah, a, a dangerous, a, a more dangerous life. Um, and obviously the child, um, if you look at, if you look at nature documentaries, it does tend to be the, it's the young of, um, species that are targeted by packs of lions and so on. So it would be the same, it would be in the same situation back then um, for these sort of primitive humans. And just to show that this it doesn't necessarily have to have been something that um, was, was happening very long ago, here's uh, man eating, here's man eating lions. So in what's that 122 years ago this railway was constructed in Africa the Kenya Uganda railway and there was people out there in tents I guess and they were um, they were building the railway and there was two male lions who hunted them and there was about 30 workers who were taken away um, and eaten by these lions um, they had to halt construction because workers were in fear as you would be <laughs> um, and eventually they, they did track them down and shoot and kill them. And that was in December 1898. So this was, again, if humans are in a kind of vulnerable situation, they are potentially um, potential prey. Um, so think ourselves lucky of our um, relatively comfortable lives. We don't have to worry about being hunted by wild animals. So that was uh, predator and prey. Next thing's ecosystem. So 
ecosystem, as I said, it's the community. So it's all the plants and animals plus the non-living components. Um, so there's a pond ecosystem. So they're not, you've got your um, deer and frog and so on. And then the non-living components could be things like um, the light intensity, the pH of the soil, the oxygen found, oxygen level within the pond. And a simple way to remember it is ecosystem can be defined as the community plus the habitat plus abiotic factors. So press pause and do that. See if you can write down the habitat, two populations and the community and then press play again. So for the habitat here, you could say the pond, you could say the mud at the bottom of the pond, either of them would be okay. You could say within these plants in the pond, um, but that any of them would be fine. Two populations, heron, well, you've got three on show here. So you've got heron, you've got these plants and you've got fish. And in the community, it's just you listing all of them. So the, one, the two populations, you could say heron, and fish, but then for the community, you'd be saying heron and fish and plants. Try this one next, four, five, and six. So the habitat here could be, I suppose you could say woodland. You could also say the grass could be a habitat for insects. You could say the tree would be a habitat. You could say the bush is a habitat. Uh, two populations, you could have um, deer, even lichen or moss you could go for, rabbit, butterfly, bird, the tree as well of course, and then describe the community. So you'd be saying the community is a mixture of plants and animals including rabbit, butterfly, um, the bush, the trees, the grass and so on. Next term is species. So here is an example of a species. And they are a group of organisms which share the same physical characteristics and can reproduce to produce fertile offspring. So remember, um, I said that fertile means that they can they can produce offspring themselves. And this is a, a way to show that you've got separate species. So if you breed two animals together, which are quite similar, and the offspring are sterile, then that would uh, be evidence that they are different species. However, you can produce hybrids. So talking of hybrids, what is that? What do you think that is? So that is a zebra and a donkey, and they are two different species, but you can breed them together to produce, to produce a zonkey. However, because the zebra and the donkey are two different species, the zonkey is sterile. So the zonkey, um, as much as it tried, would not be able to produce offspring. Um, I think you can also have a Debra as well. There's, I think it depends on which is the father and which is the mother as to whether it's a Zonkey or a, as a Debra, but um, you get the idea. We just combine the two words. So let's play Name That Hybrid. So based on that, if you get a Zebra and a Donkey together to make a Zonkey, then see if you can write down what each of these are. Press pause and have a go at that. So first one, that's a liger. Um, two, that's a zorse. Three is a bit tricky, isn't it? That's a growler bear or a pizzly bear. And the, we're beginning to see more of these um, because of um, the climate changing. What's happening is you've got um, grizzly bears which are going are able to go further north. So they're beginning to encounter polar bears and they're breeding together. This one down here, that's a wolfen. This one is a cama, camel and a llama. And then the last one, and I think this is my favourite word out of the six, that's a geep. So that's a goat and a sheep. So all closely related species can breed together potentially, but you might not produce fertile offspring. Or you generally wouldn't. Okay, revision from last time. Put numbers 1 to 11 and match them up to the appropriate letter. See if you get them all right. 
So number one community is E, all the different species living in an ecosystem. Population, two is A, all the organisms of one species living in an ecosystem. Three, ecosystem is J, so simplified, it's the community plus the habitat plus abiotic factors. Four, habitat is D. Five, species is F. Six, biodiversity, variety of life is B. Seven, producer is C, an organism which can make its own food. Eight, consumer, K. Nine is H. Ten is I. And 11 is G. So this time round, we're going to look at what a food web is. Be able to also, I'll talk about the difference between a food web and a food chain too. So you need to draw out and interpret them. So here is your simple food chain. So what you've got is your producer at the bottom, because it is them that carry out photosynthesis to bring the energy into the food chain. And then from then, from them, you've got the flow of energy. First to the consumers and well, they're all consumers, aren't they? So primary, secondary, and then tertiary. You don't need to worry too much about these terms. Um, but just remember, arrows are showing the way the energy moves. Don't just draw lines here. And this is a food web. So a food chain, the one that we saw there, life's not as simple as that. You're going to have lots of different um, living things within your habitat. So in a food web, that is when you put the food chains together. So if you look here, algae and stones, snails, ducks, that's one food chain, another food chain, algae and stones, tadpoles, dragonfly larvae. So you put them together to make your food web. So food web challenge. There is four uh, food chains. Press pause and I want you to turn that into a food web in which you only write each word once. So. A uh, seagull, for example, appears in three food chains, but you would only have the seagull, the word seagull once in your food web. So press pause and do that. It should look like this. Our producer's algae. They're consumed by those three. Then mussel and limpa are both consumed by whelk. Whelk is consumed by crab. Uh, mussel is also consumed by starfish and crab and barnacle are both consumed by seagulls. So yours might be a different shape, but what you should have, just check, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, you should have eight, um, eight animals or eight living things, and then you should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine arrows. Okay, this time I'm just gonna give you the information. So press pause and use that information to draw out a food web. This is what it should look like. So you should have the producers, carrots, grasses and grains at the bottom. Um, and then you, again, don't forget that hopefully you've got the arrowheads in there. Okay. And you've not missed anything out. Next in your food web, I want you to label them. So beside the ones that are producers, put a P, consumers, CO, and so on. Pause and do that. Okay, here's what you should have. Producers should be the carrots, the grasses, and the grains. The consumers should be everything. So everything should have CO beside it, except the producers listed above. Carnivores, there's owls and foxes. Omnivores are the birds, they're the only ones. And the herbivores, rabbits, mice and grasshoppers. Okay, next thing. We have just taken away, I've forgotten what we've taken away, but I've taken something away. So with that animal, whatever it was, I've forgotten, whatever an animal that was that's gone, I want you to write down what you think would happen to the number of owls, grains, birds, grasshoppers. So you're saying increase, decrease, stay the same, but also I want you to say why. Press pause and do that. So first the owls would increase, would, sorry, they would uh, decrease. 
that would be the obvious one because they've lost a food source. There's other there's other kind of connotations here, but that would be the most obvious one. Grains, put simply, you could say, well, they would increase because something's going to stop eating them. Uh, birds would increase because they should have more grains. But again, there's various ways of picking out an answer here as long as it sort of makes sense. And then grasshoppers, well, maybe they're going to stay the same because they're going to have an increased amount of grains to eat. But if the owl's lost a food source, um, is it mice? I think I've just remembered it's mice. If the owls have now lost a food source, then they're going to shift to eating grasshoppers. So that might negate the fact that the grasshoppers have got more grains to eat. But various different routes you can go with that as long as it makes sense, you're, it's fine. So the next part of the ecosystem topic, so you want to explain what the niche of an organism is. And also there are two types of competition, intraspecific and interspecific. So you want to describe the difference between them. So niche. And niche is the role that an organism plays within a community. So what it does. So that will involve how it use, uses resources like light and how it interacts with other organisms. So for example, competes for food. So if you look at the gazelle here, for its niche within its environment, you could say that it is, it's there to consume grass and be preyed upon by the tiger. So if you're thinking about a niche, a good way to, a good thing to do is to look at the food web and look at the interactions, look at what, what it's consuming, look at what it's cons being consumed by, and then just describe that. And in competition, so that's where two or more organisms compete for the same resource, which is in limited supply. And there are two types, so interspecific, and you've got a wolf here and a bear, and they are different species, aren't they? So that's interspecific competition. So interspecific competition is between individuals of different species, and that's for resources that they require. So you imagine this animal, this carcass, I presume that's food here. This carcass has been, it's been, is there. Maybe the wolves completed the hunt, but then the bears appeared and it wants it as well. So wolves and bears, although they're not the same species, they would compete for food. Think about plants as well. They will compete for sunlight, um, and the ones that can get grow taller um, or have the larger leaves can outcompete other plants. Intraspecific, well, if inter was different species, then intra is going to be the same. So it's competition between individuals of the same species, and that's for all the resources required. So and because they are competing for exactly the same thing, it's more intense. So Obviously, here you've got male lions and they'd potentially be competing for a mate. Okay, so more intense than interspecific competition. And the way I, I like to tell people to try and remember it interspecific competition, so differ in species. And then intra has got an A in it, and same has got an A in it. And here are a few nice wee videos which show you different um, different examples of competition. So you can you can have a if you just search for these on YouTube, you can go and have a look. So a wee task, put down numbers one to seven and write down if you think you're seeing intra or inter specific competition. So number one, squirrels and blackbirds eating seeds at a bird feeder, that is inter specific. John and Joe chatting up Jack and Fiddlers, that is intra, same species, humans. Oak and sycamore trees side by side in a field, they're different species, so inter. Riven whale antelopes fighting for territory, that's intra. A fox and eagle fighting over a deer carcass, inter. One species of bacteria grown in a petri dish, so it's one species, so that's intra. Male peacocks displaying their feathers to a female, that's intra specific. So as I mentioned before, you can use the food web 
So eight, nine, and 10 do that. Describe the niche of the rabbits, the mice, and the grains. Press pause. So for the rabbits, we can say their role is to, be con is to consume carrots and grasses, be consumed by foxes, and don't forget competition, compete with grasshoppers for grasses. Mice consume grains, be consumed by owls, compete with grasshoppers and birds for grains. And then the last one, grains, um, this is something you might have missed. You might have just gone straight on to what they're eaten by. So they're consumed by birds, mice and grasshoppers, but don't forget their part, their kind of absolutely vital role is to bring energy into the, into the food web or the food chain. So they are making their own food. And you could also have said that they're competing with carrots, grasses, and, and uh, with carrots and grasses, and that's for light, but also for space and also for water coming through the roots as well as nutrients. What is this? Any idea of why I've put this in here? Probably not. And then actually, um, sometimes I forget why I put this in here. Um, what I'm trying to um, <laughs> What I'm trying to talk about here is could this have happened? So the dinosaurs, as we know, went extinct um, most likely because an asteroid hit the planet 65 million years ago. Now, if the dinosaurs hadn't become extinct, then would we be here? So that's my question. Now, the chances are the the, the answer is no. Um, so. What happened was you had all these dinosaurs, you had your predators, your Tyrannosaurus rex, you had your large grazers, and they were they were occupying the niches in lots of different um, ecosystems around the planet. And mammals like us, we were just, our ancestors were just little burrowing things that um, kind of kept out the road. And it wasn't until the dinosaurs became extinct that we began, that mammals um, began to kind of spread out a bit. So. So when there's, as I said, when the when the niches that opened up would be land predation, so of smaller mammals. This is something that was dominated by wolves. Also aquatic predation as well. So you had um, whales began to anim animals of which eventually became whales evolved because they could uh, they could predate on fish. And also, when you got rid of these big dinosaurs, you then had things like giraffe, giraffes, which could eat plants. Um, they evolved. Um, because the dinosaurs had gone and it was they had free reign. So, so yeah, it's a strange thought, but if the asteroid hadn't hit the planet, then probably we wouldn't be here. Um, we wouldn't have evolved. And um, what was I going to say? I've forgotten what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. So humans, kind of modern humans, have probably only been around for about 500,000 years, whereas dinosaurs were on the planet for like something like 150 million years. So... The, the kind of time in which they they dominated um, compared to the time that our one individual species dominated is, uh, yeah, they, they, were, they were there for much longer than we have been so far. Okay, the last thing in this is um, just a nice thing for you to watch so you can search for this. So we... Um, there are other humans, there were other human species and they all died out, unfortunately. So it's just us, we're Homo sapiens, but we did live um, alongside Homo neanderthalensis, um, Neanderthals, and we do um, have some of their genes, which means there was breeding between humans and Neanderthals, but um, they've gone. And whether we outcompeted them for resources or not, or whether they just became extinct on their own without much influence from us is it's still open for debate, but this is um, it's worth watching, it's good.